Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. First Corinthians 9:19. For although I'm free in every way from anyone's control, wow. The apostle Paul said, for although I am free in every way from anyone's control, hallelujah, for although I am free in every way from anyone's control, I have made myself a bondservant to everyone so that I might gain the more for Christ. You know what he's saying? I am free. Jesus has set me free. And I do not have to be controlled by anybody, but because I understand that freedom, I am free now to make myself a servant because I'm willing to do whatever is going to work out the best in order for these people to be led to Christ. That's a wonderful scripture. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. Everything is permissible, allowable, and lawful for me. See, Paul knew he was free from the law. But not all things are helpful and good for me to do. Expedient and profitable when considered with other things. Everything is lawful for me, but I will not become the slave of anything or be brought under its power. Wow. Paul was making an announcement. And if you have addictions in your life, Even if you have some kind of substance addiction or an eating disorder, you should get up every day and declare loudly, sin is not my master and I will not be brought under the power of anything. <laughs> Now here's the mistake that we make. We want to wait until we see that happening before we will declare that it's a truth. Well, how can I say I'm free when I'm obviously not? Because God says you are. The devil says you're in bondage. God says you're free. If you agree with the devil, you'll keep getting more of what you got. But I have no self-control. I have no discipline. I'm in bondage. <laughs> I'm just in such bondage. Oh, I'm in bondage. I'll never get over my past. I'm in such bondage. I'm addicted, I'm addicted, I'm addicted, I'm addicted. <laughs> you know what? When I used to smoke cigarettes and I really wanted to quit, I would drive down the highway smoking my cigarette saying, I can't stand to smoke, don't like to smoke, don't want to smoke. I quit smoking. And the thing that's very beautiful about this is I didn't know what I'm teaching you now. It was something I felt like God led me to do. And within two weeks, I had quit. And I had tried for years prior to that. I'm telling you, you got to start agreeing with God. Stop saying I'm in bondage and start saying I am free, I am free, I am free, I am free, I am free. Come on, that'll do you a lot of good. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But like a boxer, I buffet my body. I discipline it. I subdue it. And I love this. For fear that after proclaiming to others the gospel and things pertaining to it, I myself should become unfit, not stand the test, be unapproved, rejected as a counterfeit. And we have such a problem with that in the church today. We preach to everybody. But where's our witness? Types of addictive behaviors. Alcohol, drugs, we get that. Food becomes a big problem for a lot of people. They don't feel good about themselves, and so they eat for comfort. Eating disorders, anorexia, bulimia. One, people starve themselves. The other, they binge and eat way more than any person could eat, and then go make themselves throw up. These are dangerous disorders. And in all probability, we have some people right in this room today that are dealing with these same kinds of things. 
I had one girl tell me that she, after many years of treatment and no help, she bought my Battlefield of the Mind book, and she said, when I had the urge to go throw up, I would kneel down in front of that toilet that was stealing my life and read that Battlefield of the Mind book out loud. And she got completely set free. You see, if you think you have to stay in bondage all your life, if you think you can't control it, where the mind goes, the man follows. Our emotions get all involved in this. And God doesn't want us to have broken hearts and wounded emotions and messed up personalities. He wants us to know who we are in Christ, to know that the fruit of the Spirit in us, to know that God loves us unconditionally. And yes, we don't have it all together, and we are imperfect, but we are just the ones that Jesus died for. They say that in some private affluent schools, that this anorexia thing is an absolute epidemic. Because many of these children come from very affluent families who instead of taking time to love their children and invest in their lives, they buy them everything they want. We're in dangerous times because everybody is busy, 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 busy. I remember when life wasn't like it is now. I've been around a while. I remember when we had a phone in our home that four other families used. It was a party line, a four-way party line. <laughs> and when you picked the phone up, if somebody was on it, you just had to wait till they got off. My gosh, now, if we're in an area for two minutes where we can't get a cell phone signal, you would think the world was coming to an end. This stupid highway, every time I go through this area, I cannot make my phone calls. I remember when if you're out in a car and you wanted to make a phone call, you had to pull over to the side of the road and find a pay phone. People used to give their children time, now they give them money. Electronics. <laughs> Just a word of caution. Your kids want you more than they want what you can buy for them. There are even feeling addictions. People get addicted to certain kinds of feeling, like excitement. They can't deal with ordinary, plain, everyday life, Monday through Friday. Religious righteousness. There are people who are so wounded inside and they feel so worthless. And man, when they get a little bit of religion, now following all the rules and regulations is how they find their worth and value, and they become the most obnoxious people on the planet. And if you are one, get over it. I was one. I'm telling you what, I would have made a chief Pharisee if the Holy Ghost wouldn't have got a hold of me. Because I was so proud of all the things that I did right and so looked down on people who didn't do what I did. <laughs> I fasted, I prayed. <laughs> Come on. There's so many things that people can get addicted to. Some people punish themselves for the way they feel about themselves by feeling guilty all the time. That was me. I didn't feel right if I didn't feel wrong. My guilt was my self-punishment. Some people are joy addicts. They have a continual frozen smile on their face. <laughs> they never have a bad day. They never have a problem. They're just happy in Jesus. <laughs> and you look at them and you think, man, my guts are falling out. You can't be real. <laughs> and then there are thought addictions. Worrying all the time. How many of you just worry, 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 worry? You are wasting your time. But people say, well, you got to worry about your kids. You're not a good parent if you don't worry about your kids. Now, where can you find that in the Bible? 
detailing, excessive planning. Yes, there's nothing wrong with having a plan, but God's got a better plan than we do. So you're kind of wasting your time planning too far in the future. What we need is not a plan. We need to be led by the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Have a plan, but get out of God's way if he's got another plan. People get addicted to pornography. Another mind addiction. I was addicted to reasoning. I had to have everything figured out or I couldn't be still. Now, people get kind of weird about the word addiction. I wrote a book called Approval Addiction, and it did good, but it didn't do nearly as good as I would have liked it to have done. And I realized after it was because of the word addiction. People don't want to think they're addicted to anything, even if they are. What is approval addiction? It means you can't settle down and feel happy if you don't feel like that everybody approves of you. What is a reasoning addiction? It means that you cannot settle down. You cannot have peace unless you think you've got it all figured out. Come on. Anybody else got a reasoning addiction? All right. How about an approval addiction? Mm -hmm. We've got a few honest people here, but there's some that haven't caught up yet. How about an activity addiction? Cannot be still. I happen to understand that one. I have to be very careful, too. I like to keep it moving. <laughs> I mean, we see it on television. They've got a whole program now about people who hoard things. There's another program about people who have excessive numbers of pets. There's gambling addictions and exercising addictions and just all kinds of things. Well, what are people trying to do? They're trying to feel good about themselves. They're trying to find something to latch on to, to say, I have worth and value now because I own all this stuff. I'm okay, I've got it all together because I know what's gonna happen. I've got a plan. I'm excited. I'm happy, look how happy I am. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I'm happy. I get suspicious of people like that. Some people have an addiction to feeling important, and they will do everything that they can possibly do to feel important. I get concerned when we hire a new employee, and the first thing they want to know is, what's their title going to be? Sometimes I think, uh-oh, going to have to work through this. So you can keep dancing around this thing, whatever it is, bad temper, hard to get along with self-pity, depression, excessive mental activity, not being able to rest, being a workaholic, whatever it is. One woman went to our pastor. She said, Pastor, I'm getting married next week for the seventh time. I want you to pray that this man is going to treat me right. <laughs> that is deception to the max because out of all seven marriages, she was the only common denominator in all of them. Now, God loves you. And he loves you not because you're lovable, because in fact, we are not. He loves us because he wants to. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, to satisfy his own self. He pours his love out. On us. I better show it to you. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But God so rich is he in his mercy because of in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us. <laughs> Even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses. He made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him. 
For it is by grace, his favor and mercy, which you did not deserve that you are saved, delivered from judgment, and made a partaker of Christ's salvation. And he raised us up together with him and made us sit down together, giving us joint seating in the heavenly sphere with Christ Jesus. So now, let's look at what happens. And in this book, if you buy this book, you'll find these charts, the trickle-down theory of conditional love and the trickle-down theory of unconditional love. The trickle-down theory of conditional love. Well, Jesus loves me, but he loves me conditionally. Therefore, <laughs> his love is based on my performance. Therefore, I have to earn his love by pleasing him. <laughs> Therefore, when I please him, I feel loved, and when I don't please him, I feel rejected. Now, we've got to stop there for a minute because here's what happens. When I fail, God still loves me just as much as he did before I failed. But if I think that God's love for me is based on my performance, then when I fail, I suddenly now feel that he doesn't love me anymore. It has nothing to do with what God is. It has everything to do with my feelings, with my weird, warped, broken feelings. Do you have any idea what it will do for you to be rooted and grounded in the love of God and to know that on your worst day, God loves you just as much as he does on your best day? And that he's not asking you to feel guilty. He's asking you to be thankful. You don't need to add your guilt to Jesus' death. He already paid the price. Once and for all, for everybody, it's paid for. God doesn't need our guilt added to the sacrifice of Christ. It's not what, it, not what we need. Well, surely it can't be right to just not feel guilty. God doesn't want us to feel guilty. He wants us to be repentant. And repentant means, sorry, God, I did that. I'm willing to turn away from it. It doesn't mean just keep doing it over and over and over and live your life in guilt. Therefore, if God who is all loving does not always love, accept, and value me, how can I be expected to believe that I'm valuable and lovable? You see what happens when you know that you know that you know that God loves you now, all of a sudden you start to think, well, hey, maybe i am got a little value after all. Can you imagine how rotten I felt about myself after my dad abusing me all those years because the devil convinced me there was something wrong with me that made him do it? <laughs> if your peers in school rejected you, you probably weren't able to look at them and say, you got a problem. I'm really a great person. You should want to know me. <laughs> no, you probably thought, well, what's wrong with me? So then maybe you tried to be more like them and tried to be whatever you thought you needed to be to be part of the group. And we lose our whole identity and we get to the point where we don't even know who we are because we're trying to please all these people that don't give a rip about us anyway. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. We live our lives to make they happy and we don't even know who they are. Yeah. I hate that statement. Well, you know, they say. Well, who are they? If you can't tell me who they are, don't tell me what they say. <laughs> At least when I tell you what they say, I know who they is. It's God. <laughs> Therefore, I don't believe that I'm basically a lovable, valuable person. Therefore, I'm not able to trust other people who say they love me. <laughs> I'm very suspicious that anybody who's even nice to me has an ulterior motive because you see, way down deep inside, I don't believe that I'm lovable. I've already believed that you're not going to like me before we ever start trying to have a relationship. And so I act weird. And then I prove that I'm right after all, that you don't like me because now you disappear out of my life. Therefore, I cannot, cannot accept love from other people. I deflect it, and I try to prove to them that I'm right, that I am not lovable. 
Look and see how weird I am. I believe that they will eventually reject me, and therefore they do. <laughs> so therefore I use the world standards, money, position, power, status, clothes, to prove to myself and others that I am valuable. I'm valuable, I'm a doctor. Whoever says, I'm valuable, I'm a janitor. But see, you are, you're just as valuable as the doctor. The people who came and volunteered to make, to let us have this meeting and keep order in here are just as important as I am. And you think, oh, no, they're not. Yes, they are. They're just as important to God. They might not be as important to you right now as I am in this moment, but they are just as important to God. You are just as important to God as I am today. You are just as important as the people leading worship. You are just as important to God as anybody else on this planet. He loves you just as much because he loves you unconditionally. I need strokes and feedback from other people, and I love this part, to prove to myself and to others that I am lovable. You need to tell me that I'm okay. Therefore, I need a fresh fix of strokes every day just to get through the day feeling good about myself. <laughs> well, Dave, you, you, you didn't tell me I looked nice this morning. <laughs> well, I like it that Dave tells me that I look nice, but I can go look in the mirror and see if I'm okay or not. <laughs> I like it. I turned sideways this morning and thought, whoa, not bad for almost 70. It's not that I don't need compliments from other people. I love them, but I don't have to have them to make it through the day. And you know what happens when you don't have to have them? You get more of them. Are you here? If you don't have to have them, you get more of them. Therefore, I look to other people to give me something that only God can give me, which is a sense of my own self-worth. My. Therefore, I place impossible demands on people who do love me. <laughs> I frustrate them. I'm never satisfied with what they're giving me. I will not allow them to be honest with me or to confront me. And I am focused on me and I expect them to be focused on me too. <laughs> Just two more sections. Therefore, since I don't love who I am, I don't expect that others will love me either. Why would anyone want something to do with something that has no real value? Therefore, I try to earn their love by what I do. I don't give to people out of a desire to love them, but to be loved. Most of what I do is tied up in self. So the people that I profess to love don't feel loved. They feel manipulated. I'm really trying to avoid rejection rather than trying to build a loving, lasting relationship. Now, if I had time, which I don't, I could go through the other one, the trickle-down theory of unconditional love, and it's just the absolute opposite. You can get it in the Beauty for Ashes book. <laughs> I'll do a few sentences. If you promise to give me five more minutes, I'll give it to you. All right, here you go. We'll go fast. Jesus loves me, this I know, and he loves me unconditionally. Therefore, I have not earned his love, nor can I earn his love. Therefore, I cannot be separated from his love. When I obey him, he will bless me. When I disobey him, there will be consequences. He may not like my behavior, but he always loves me. Therefore, since I have experienced God's love, I know that I am lovable. Therefore, since I know that God loves me, I'm able to believe that there are people who could love me too. Therefore, I'm able to trust people who love me. 
Therefore, I'm able to accept the love that people give me. Man, this makes you so confident. You can go out in the world and not be afraid of rejection because you feel good about yourself. And actually, if somebody does reject you, you know right away they got a problem. Well, there's only one way to truly recover from addictive behavior, and that is to know who we are in Christ and to believe that we have worth and value because Jesus died for us. కల రోజు నేను వాళ్ళ దగ్గర నీళ్ళు తాడానికి వెళ్తూ ఉండే అందరిలా అబ్బడికి వెళ్ళి చదువుకోవాలనుకుండే కానీ పోకపోతుండే అందుకే అందరిలా నాకు ఫ్రెండ్స్ లేరు ఎప్పుడు చూసినా మా పిల్లలు బాగా ఉండరండి ఎప్పుడు చూసిన ఇరోచనాలు జ్వరం అవుతుండే డాక్టర్ కాడికి వెళ్దామంటే పైసలు లేవు ఇంకా పిల్లలు అట్నే పండుకొని ఉంటారు వి హ్ బీన్ ఏబుల్ టు ఐడెంటిఫై దీస్ విలేజెస్ త్రూ గవర్నమెంట్ అండ్ త్రూ సమ్ లోకల్ ప్యాస్టర్స్ సో దిస్ వెల్స్ వాట్ వి ఆర్ డ్రిల్లింగ్ టు జాయిస్ మైర్ మినిస్ట్రీస్ నో వి టేక్ ప్రాపర్ కేర్ టు ఫైండ్ వేర్ ఈస్ ద గుడ్ వాటర్ through a good water diviner it will take about 3 uh, days to go to that village and drill the bore well to give fresh water to the villagers na pillalu kuda badiki pottaru నేను కూడా పొలం పనికి పోయి బాగా సంపాదిస్తాను ఈ గ్రామంలో బోరేయించడం ద్వారా ఇక్కడ ఉన్న వాళ్ళందరి జీవితంలో ఎంతో మార్పు వచ్చింది ఇక్కడ ఉన్న వాళ్ళందరి అవసరాలు తీరుతున్నాయి కాబట్టి యేసు ప్రభు దేవుని తెలుసుకొని సంఘంలో సభ్యులుగా చేరడానికి ఎంతో ఆరాట పడుతున్నారు మాకు ఇక్కడ ఒక బోరేయించి మా ఆత్మీయ దాహాన్ని తీరుస్తున్నారు మేము పాస్టర్ ద్వారా ఆ నిజమైన దేవుణ్ణి తెలుసుకొని ఈ సంఘంలో ఆ యేసు ప్రభుని ఆరాధిస్తున్నాం